you know, it's hard to narrow down who the funniest people of all time, but it's a, a great exercise when challenged. And Art and I came up with three of our favorite funniest people of all time. Art, who do we have? Yeah, well, um, one of my favorite funniest people of all time is Mel Brooks. The guy has done so many different kinds of comedy. I mean, he did film, he did theater, he did television. He do, he's done everything. He's he, an and he did he's stand up. Emmy, he's got the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony. Oh, yeah. That's it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, if he did nothing more than the producers, he would be still the movie. You know, if the movie. I'm talking about the movie. Not, right, the, exactly. not the theatrical musical, but the movie. And when that came out, I could not believe how how funny it was. I mean, uh, it was just when they came out singing "Springtime for Hitler," I fell off my chair. I couldn't believe anybody was doing something like that. And I have to remind the audience out there: when you think about it, we were still, I think, only like twenty five years from World War II. It's not like Hitler. You know, they say tragedy plus time equals comedy. That tragedy, by the way, is still raw now. But when that movie came out, was it was unheard of this idea that that they could do a movie. And obviously, there, I, I think Mel Brooks has said his stated goal in life is to embarrass Hitler every chance he get. And he has done that more and more. But you know, the movie was very controversial when it came out for that. I remember my father saying, "I'm not watching that." It's about Hitler. I'm not doing it. You know, people really took offense, but it was so beautifully done and it was so funny. And, and the audience, what's great about that is he acknowledges how offensive it is because it's the premise of the movie. Like, like let's make a play, the worst play ever, which, so it's very meta, right? The, the premise of the movie is also the premise of this horrible play and the audience's reaction to it, you know, mortification. Right. But then at the beginning, they can't believe how horrible it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then Zero Mostel and, and Gene Wilder think, okay, great, this is going great. This thing is going to fail so quickly. And they go across the street and have a couple of drinks. And then at, at intermission, people f come in and they say, that is the funniest play we ever saw. <laughs> and they realize it's going to be a hit. And yeah, it's and like the whole thing just went went to hell. It's very And that's funny. one movie we're just talking about. Oh, yeah. So, so, so let's, so let's talk you, about more Mel think, Brooks stuff. You, yeah, what I love about Mel is how he covered just every genre, because he, he was a film lover. If you look at those old Sid Caesar shows, which was truly the predecessor of Saturday Night Live, they did movie parodies, farm film parodies in the 1950s on network television. So he was obviously a lover of film. And to tackle, you know, when he, had to, he hasn't made a lot of films, and everyone has got a, a, an incredible batting average of success of great films, but he covered westerns, because he grew up with westerns, right? So he covered westerns, with Blazing Saddle. And then Half Kidding said, boy, it would be great if we can get Frankie Lane to sing this. And like, we can get Frankie Lane to sing the theme, which <laughs> <laughs> Blazing Saddles. So he I covered know. Westerns. I'll, I'll do the genres art, then we could dig deeper into the films. Horror classics, right? With Young Frankenstein. Yep. Oh, he yeah. did uh, biblical epics with the history of the world part one. Right. He did silent movie, literally with silent movie, right. uh, and High Anxiety, Alfred Hitchcock. And I think I'm probably missing if, uh, some others, but what's your favorite Mel Brooks movie after The Producers? I'd have to say uh, Young Frankenstein. I, I mean, I just, I just watched that over and over because it was such a great send up of everything. Uh, and of course, Gene Wilder, you know, who was in so many of his, you know, obviously. That was his idea. He had a, you know, he had a oh, was Wilder's idea? Yes, he, he had was a great, great love of Gene Wilder in his movies. And a, a, a tremendous it, respect for him who, who saved his ass on yeah. uh, on Blazing Saddles, right? Like, by, That's right. You know, what a great job he did with that. But uh, the great thing about Mel, he's a great collaborator because, and he got that from being in the writer's room at the Sid Caesar show, which at one time oh, yeah. or another, Carl Reiner, Woody Allen, Neil Simon, Larry Gelbart. Like, I know, some of the funniest are, guys is, in the whole I mean, world. Yes. So, when, like, to, another great movie of his, which he didn't write or direct, but inspired, was uh, the movie My Favorite Year, which was based on 
Mm-hmm. On the, the Sid Caesar writers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. On the, and the character, Benji Stone, was based on Mel Brooks, uh, the writer from Brooklyn uh, with the over-the-top uh, family who, who had, I think in real life, Mel had to chaperone, I believe, Claude Rains or, or Errol Flynn was guesting on that week's We talked a lot Caesar about show. Mel Brooks in his films, but the guy was, when we talk about funny guys, we mean guys who can be funny at any moment, anywhere, anytime. Any and decade. <laughs> any decade i think the 2000 year old man which is a great great mel brooks character is is an example of that that came about because he was with carl reiner fitting i'm sure you know the story he's at a party with, yeah he's with carl reiner and and they had to do some uh, like a toast or something and he they're testing the mic and carl reiner says hey you know so what, what does it feel like to be uh the oldest man in the world 2,000 years old. And without missing a beat, Mel Brooks just went right into it. Well, I'll tell you, you know, being that old. And he went into, you know, with a Yiddish accent, and it was hysterically funny. And they went on and did records and cartoons well, they, yeah, but, and all things. And they did it actually at parties for the longest time with no intention of doing anything with it. Cary Grant was a huge fan on the party circuit of what they did. Uh, and George Burns at one point went over uh, to Mel and said, if you don't release this, I'm stealing it. And Steve Allen put up the money for a That's recording incredible. of it. And that's it became, incredible. and that's where he got the Grammy for. And so much of that was improvised. I yeah, mean, you can absolutely. hear it. You can hear it in Reiner when he's laughing at something that that Mel Brooks said. I remember when he, he says, "So what's the great? You know, you're two thousand years old. What's the greatest invention of all time?" <laughs> and Mel Brooks says, "The greatest saran wrap. You, wrap, you take something, wrap it up, you put it in the fridge. It's fresh." <laughs> <laughs> and you hear you hear Reiner just can't get, control himself. He's laughing so hard. Another one on our list. Uh, you know, I feel like my top three list is probably has a uh, fifty people on it. But this is the cream of the crop. Uh, uh, Buster Keaton art. Uh, I don't know how deep a dive you've been. I know you worked on a great silent comedy series. Yeah, I worked on a silent comedy series with Robert Klein when I was at Comedy Channel. Si- the Silent Comedians. And for that... It was Dead Comedian Society. Dead Comic Society. <laughs> it was the Dead Comic Society. <laughs> we we stood... We were in the. I was in the booth with Robert Klein forever watching, you know, the great comedians. And when we hit Buster Keaton, oh. Klein was like, this is the greatest physical comedian ever and he just loved him and I learned to love him at that point we watched so much of his stuff so many of his gags what what an influence on on Wes Anderson framing uh, Woody Allen you know that, that Sherlock Jr. I believe was a movie where he walks on and off the screen which Purple Rose of Cairo right. uh, took from that but yeah like the sight gags uh, uh, one week uh, newly married couple and everything goes wrong including uh, a, 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 a great misdirection where you think they're going to dodge a train hitting the house and then it goes the other way. And the second train hits the house or the house falls uh, uh, right on Keaton and he, he makes it through the windows. What was the thing that he broke his neck on? on? Oh, yeah. There's, there's a thing where he is walking along the train, right? The train's moving and he's walking along and he walks back and he finally gets to the thing where he, there's a water tower and right. he grabs the wa- rope on the water water tower and the train leaves and he falls down and pulls the rope down and this water comes gushing out down on him knocks him down he gets up and you know looks at it years later he was at the doctor's he had to get x-ray for something and the doctor said hey when'd you break your neck and Keaton said I never broke my neck and it turns out that that was the time he broke his neck in the filming of that scene That's... and he didn't even know it. He's, he's standing there if I broke my neck I would lie down. You first would know it. You first would know it. First, first of all, my I'm lawyer would down. be in touch immediately. <laughs> then I would scream, right? This guy, nothing. I don't, I'm, I, you can't believe how much punishment he took during his how about, how about the speeding car that he just yanks the handle on the back of the car and gets taken away with it? Or the motorcycle? You know, he's going from one car to another, which in and of itself is ridiculous, right? And he suddenly finds himself straddling two cars, one foot on each one. By the way, these cars are going pretty fast fast and then a motorcycle goes between them swoops in and takes them away i know it's crazy what he did you know you wonder and i i wondered about how he got to the point where he could do all that stuff apparently when he was a kid he was in a vaudeville act with his parents and his parents as one of the pieces of the act would pick him up he's like five years old swing him around throw him around the stage they and throw, him into, throw the him into the audience yeah they broke i think he broke a guy's neck once because because <laughs> 
<laughs> the guy who's... Uh, We're uh, laughing. It's contact. not that funny. Uh, you and know. and, and, uh, and one final thing on Buster, he got his name from Houdini, the nickname, because when he, when he shook himself off and he stood up at five years of age after being flung into some scenery, uh, Houdini said, boy, he's quite the Buster, man. He's incredible. And that was the birth of Buster Keaton. That's it. Yeah. He, he could, loved he could... and highly recommend. Yeah, he could he could take a lot of punishment. Richard Pryor, I remember the first time I saw him on Ed Sullivan's show, and I believe it was his first appearance. Um, and he was, you know, he was young. He was like 19 years old or something. He was wearing a black suit and a skinny black tie. Yeah. And he comes on and he's, the thing that I noticed about him was that he was doing physical comedy as well as stand-up comedy. He wasn't just talking into the mic, you know, or maybe gesturing a little bit. He was telling a story about how he was scared on the he playground by these bullies. And he was like, he looked so scared. I was I was scared for him. I mean, it was just amazing, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember my actually first experience with him, and this is so lame, but it's true. I mean, he did a lot of guesting before he was the Richard Pryor we know. I remember seeing him on a Partridge Family episode, and, and being very, very funny, didn't know he was going to become that guy. Uh, and then the thing that really got on my radar was that SNL, when he was on SNL with, with Chevy Chase. And I can't quote it verbatim, but that was the word association, you know, honky blah blah you know they were going back and forth between richard pryor and chevy chase that was pretty groundbreaking even now it would be uh difficult to do but really really funny and then his um the live stand-up movie his live stand-up was was classic one of the things that really cracked me up and he did this in a lot of the stand-up acts i don't even know if we can well he when he was talking and he said yeah and then this white guy came up to me and said right. something when he talked like a white guy his impression of talking like a white you know white person every time it cracked me up it was like yes I, I i just wondered if you would be i mean i can't even do it it was just so unbelievably funny and in such contrast to the way richard Pryor talked unbelievable and he was uh one of the writers on blazing saddles yeah. He, he was going to play the sheriff in the movie, but the studio didn't want to take the chance on him because they, they didn't think he was going to be, I think it was reliable enough at the time. There may have been some issues. Uh, and Cleveland Little was amazing in that. But yeah, so so those are our three. And I think um, their their body of work has stood the test of time. Keaton, it's, it's tough. Hopefully people will rediscover it over the years, but they're all incredible.